God bless every one of you. Wonderful, wonderful worship. I so loved your granddad, Jack Hayford. Am I correct? And he was one of the great friends to me throughout my life and throughout our ministry. And Greg whispered to me who you were, and I said, well, that makes sense. Because I talked to my 50-year-old son today who's pastoring in a little town called Rockwall, Texas, where we built a small little church called Church on the Rock. And he's there now doing great. And I want to give God the glory that all four of my children are serving God today, <laughs> loving God, and worshiping God as you did tonight. While you're standing, I want to you to take note that I'm honoring tonight the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to give glory to Him alone who is worthy. But I want you to notice that I do see one man here and maybe one other I saw as I looked around the room that I'm wearing my black suit tonight and a tie. Now Susan knows quite well that on most occasions when Dr. Cirillo would go out to preach in the great conventions that we enjoyed together as I traveled around the world with Dr. Cirillo, he would wear, it looked like the same black suit and the same tie. And so I'm wearing my black suit and rarely do I put on a tie, but in honor to whom honor is due, we say glory to God tonight, amen. I want you to reach your hand out toward me, if you would, and pray your best prayer, because I pray the Holy Spirit will literally impregnate you with a fresh revelation tonight concerning the blood, particularly now at Passover season. Lord, I receive the prayers of your precious people. They've been sent here tonight, each one. And Lord, you've given me a specific assignment tonight. And Lord, I'm under that assignment to speak this word that I pray, oh Lord, will take deep root in their lives. Now put your hand over your heart and let me pray that your heart will just open up right now back to the, to the, the band, all of you that are watching online. All of you that are here in this great auditorium, I declare the opening of your heart right now for the receiving of the engrafted word which has the power to transform your spirit, your soul, your body, and your resources in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Take your seat for just a moment because I love this scripture behind me that was here a moment ago, 2 Chronicles 7, 15. Most people know 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. But very few know. Verse 15, and verse 15 says, I will always hear prayer from this place. It's not up there now, but trust me, it's in the Bible. Amen. And I took note of that years ago when I first visited Israel in 19, all the way back 71. I was in the first a cappella choir to sing at Bethlehem Square after Bethlehem had opened back up after the Jews from 1968 were able to go, come and go throughout uh, without danger in the city of Bethlehem. It was quite a place. And I had a great experience in that year because I stayed and studied at the Hebrew University archaeology for a semester. And during that year, my life fell uh, deeply in love with the nation of Israel. Not only because I was a, 
a Bible student, and I was in biblical studies at a very prestigious Baptist university. And may I just submit to you that I, I am a, the original Bapticostal. <laughs> because I heard myself praying in tongues, and I was the first person I ever heard pray in tongues. All I'd ever heard about praying in tongues was, was or, or the Holy Spirit was like, now I baptize you in water in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, and be baptized. And then I heard one other thing as in my uh, upbringing was stay away from those Pentecostal people that speak in tongues. That's all I'd ever heard. And when I heard myself speaking in tongues, one night saying a dangerous prayer, Lord, I don't care what it costs me. I just want the power that's in this book that I'm giving my life to study. The next thing I heard was myself praying in an unknown tongue. And I've said this before. You may have heard it. I said, Lord, this is going to ruin my ministry. He said, yes, son, but this is the beginning of my ministry in your life. And that's where it started. And it never stopped, even though I went all the way through uh, not only undergraduate Bible study, and then I went to graduate school at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, the largest theological seminary in the world at that time. And uh, during those years, I learned to defend the reality of the Holy Spirit, that He's not God the Father, Son, and Holy Bible. He's God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Holy Spirit interprets to us the infallible Word of God. And so if I could just be so bold to say to you that the assignment that I have from the Lord tonight is very specific. God dealt with me after my call from Greg last night. I have been wrestling in my spirit. I remember Dr. Cirillo at one of the great meetings in London, and I, did, I think I did most, if not all, the mission to London's, and then he and I had, the, I had the privilege of going to Israel twice more with him, and I lived coming and going from Israel almost, yeah, I went 16 times back and forth, but at one of the meetings, <clears throat> the miracles were so profound through Dr. Cirillo's life. The reason that we're here tonight is because of the miraculous ministry of Morris Cirillo. And so I whispered in his ear going out to the platform, Susan. I said, MC, as we, he preferred to be called, Dr. Cirillo, tell me, how does it work in you concerning the miracles? And he looked me right in the eye and he said, Larry... I take the miracles into the meeting with me. In other words, he was saying, I wrestle in the Spirit. I get still before the Lord until God reveals by the Spirit. Don't you remember Jesus said, I do nothing but what I see and hear? And so all those miracles that you will read about and hear about concerning the great life and ministry and now the legacy of Morris Cirillo as it lives on, you'll know it came by revelation. Let's all say revelation. And revelation always involves an experience. And God wants you to have an experience tonight. How many of you in this place tonight are really accepting and believing for more in 24? Amen. Let me push to that down the road just a little bit, how many believe that God can literally work miracles to turn your life around? Anybody here expecting that to happen in your life? I grew up in a little town in East Texas. It's about 120 miles east of Dallas called Kilgore, Texas. Kilgore, Texas was a town 100 years ago from right now of just a little over 100 people. And the farmers that were dirt poor, they were very, very uh, disappointed because they couldn't grow any crops on the ground where they had purchased and had been uh, expecting to have a good life as farmers. 
They said the soil is messed up here. It's kind of oily. Until one of them drilled a water well. And a gusher of oil came up out of the earth. It was like a tsunami. And so they began to drill. Downtown Kilgore, Texas is nothing but oil wells. And all around that area, as a matter of fact, the home I grew up in had an oil well in the front yard and one in the backyard. And may I just submit to you, we didn't own either one of them. But at the same time, it was just the way we grew up. And now there's a plaque in downtown Kilgore that says world's richest acre for 50 years in the United States of America. God dealt with me that right beneath the surface of your life, right beneath the surface of your life, where things aren't growing the way you want them to, where things aren't moving the way you want them to, may I submit to you tonight that as a result of this night, there are going to be some miracles and I'm talking about millionaire miracles because those dirt farmers, four of them became multimillionaires within one year. I believe there's millionaires sitting in this room tonight, and you'll never hear me say that frivolously. You've never heard me say that, have you, Greg? God dealt with me that in this room, get ready, praise God, right under the soil that won't work, there is a subterranean gusher of the oil of the Holy Spirit that's going to come up out of the earth, if you will, and you're the earth, come up out of your belly, and the revelation that you're going to experience is going to move you from here to there into the promise that you're carrying from God. Anybody receive that tonight? I'm on assignment here tonight to talk about the blood. How many of you believe that Andre Krauts was right? The blood will never lose its power. The first Passover in Exodus chapter 12, I'm only going to read a couple of verses from verse 11 through 13. But it says, Thus you shall eat with a belt on your waist, sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, so... You shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on this night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. And I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The very next verse says this. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on your houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Hallelujah. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. With all the craziness that's going on in our world right now, we need the speaking of the blood. Amen. As we've never needed it before. In 1978, I went back to Israel to, to live in the house of a man that was a Jewish gentleman, but was a believing Jew who was a prophet to Israel. He had given prophecies to Golden My Golden Meir that was the prime minister during those days about the Six-Day War and other things that had been recognized throughout all of Israel. And somehow I became friends with him because he was visiting the United States and he called me out and he and I became friends. And so when my pastor, where I was youth pastor from 1972 to 1978, suddenly got very ill. The Lord dealt with me to sell my 
I'll just call it what it was, a hippie van. Now, some of y'all have no idea what that what is, but it was all cut, it was all painted, and it, it, was, it looked like a hippie van, as it was. But uh, I, I, was, I had short hair, but it was a hippie van. But I sold it and several other things to buy the ticket to get to Brother Levy's house, the prophet of God. I got there to his house, and he said, the first thing we're going to do is fast. I said, how many days, Brother Levy? He said, we're going to fast, and we're going to pray for seven days. So for seven days, we prayed and we fasted. I believe we drank some water, but that was about it. I'll never forget, he had a wolf in the backyard where we had, uh, he had built little cottages in the backyard, which was about four acres. My dad and I ended up buying that four acres right outside of Azor, uh, right, right down from Tel Aviv. And uh, the fact of the matter was, Brother Levy said, don't go back there because I have a wolf back there, a literal half dog, half wolf that guards the cottages. And he's on a chain, and I'm the only one that can get near him. And I remember after seven days of the Holy Spirit, I said, Lord, if this is really you talking to me, because I was crying out for the life of my pastor, who was terminally ill according to medical science. And I was praying, Lord, heal my pastor. His name was Howard Knatzer. Heal, Brother Howard, I said. Then I said, Lord, what do you want me to do with my responsibilities now as the other preaching pastor of that Baptist church that had grown from 400 to 4,000 in those six and a half years? I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, you will be refused. That's all he said. The two things I was asking for, I got a no on both of them. Now, may I submit to you an anointed no is just as anointed as an anointed yes. And Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And those were things I could not begin to reason with the Lord to talk him out of it in any way because I knew that voice in my spirit because I'd been living by that voice since that experience of praying in the spirit. How many of you know if you pray in an unknown tongue, you should also pray that you interpret, that you interpret what you're praying? And so I had been living in the spirit realm now for a good seven years, and by this time, uh, I was fully equipped to hear God. And I said, Lord, if that's you, let me go lay down beside the wolf. And he said, go ahead. I remember when I got within about, he was on a chain, and when he, I got within about five yards of him, I heard Brother Libby crying, don't go any closer. And I went down and laid right beside the wolf, and he began to lick me on my face. And I said, Jesus, I got cold chills going all over my body right now. I'll never forget the experience. After I go back home, within a week, Brother Knatzer died. He actually didn't die. He just passed. How many of you know that the, because of the blood of the Lamb, you will never die? Now, I'm going to touch that again in just a moment, but just stay with that for a moment. Just hold, hold that for a moment. But after he died, the deacon board of that Baptist church got together, and they were not part of the Spirit-filled movement. They came to me and said, well, we have to deal with you. I said, well, why do you have to deal with me? He said, because everybody coming through here prophesies, Hilton Sutton, others had come through, of, of great Judson Cornwall, so many others of the great old prophets of that day, they come through and said, this is the Joshua of the house. And I was sitting there with those men, and they said to me, Larry, we're not going to let you be our pastor, but you can be our preacher if you want to be, and we're going to run the church. And I looked at them, and I said, well, I'll always respect elders in the church, and I will assign elders and build it. He, they said, we're not going to have a youth church here. I said, why not? 
They said, because we refuse you. And I'd heard that word in my spirit right before I laid down by the wolf. And so I was there hearing the great old gospel song, Hit the Road, Jack, and Don't You Come Back No More, No More, No More, No More, having to go home now with a master's degree in theology, set up to go into the Ph.D. program because I had the grades to do it, sleeping in the same bed I slept in the night I graduated from high school with nothing, nowhere to go. And the man of God in that city of a, had a very small church, about 300 people. The Lord sent me to him because I heard he was a man of prayer. And I had been under conviction about my prayer life because I knew my prayer life was not as strong as my preaching life. And I said, Lord, I've got to learn something about prayer that I don't have, although I've been praying in tongues for years. How many believe that you can learn something more about prayer? Because you'll never stop exploring that topic. And you'll never need it more than you're going to need it in the years to come. But at the same time, I'm going to give you a key tonight, and if you take the key and you use it, you're going to find out that the Lord will keep his word to you. This man got up every morning at 4.30, and at 5 a.m., he was praying, this pastor in that city, and he said, would you conduct a three-week revival here in our church? I said, sure I will. So I started revival at a 300-member church. The three-week revival lasted seven weeks. And the All-American linebacker of uh, Tatum High School, the little high school down the road, he got born again. Well, he told the whole football team with tears coming down his face, I met this little guy named Larry Lee. He told me about Jesus. And this is real. I mean, what he's preaching about is real. So the whole football team got saved. Then all the coaches got saved. Then the cheerleaders got saved. And they invited me to come on the campus to do a little assembly. I walked on the campus, and when my feet hit the campus, how I many know the Bible says wherever your feet are, are, are put, you have possession there spiritually? The children and the young people of that high school began to weep, and they wept, and they were falling out under the power, and I was having nothing to do with it. They tried to conduct an assembly, but the children were crying so loud and shouting to God, Lord, help me. Lord, save me. And we had such a revival, it lasted seven weeks. We didn't last long in that church that's now a church of five, six, seven hundred people because half of the young people that were getting saved were African Americans. And we were told by the board of that Lily White Church, you cannot baptize those young people in our baptistry. And so my pastor, Pastor B.J. Wilhite, he said, hey, look, he said, I'm going off salary. I'm not taking another nickel from this church. They said, you can go and take your boy with you. I was the boy. So I didn't know where to go, what to do, but doors would open here and there. I'd get a call like 5 o'clock in the afternoon. What are you doing? I said, I think I can make some arrangements. And I went up and asked my wife, can we fix this? She said, yes. And when she says yes, she means yes. And I Praise God for that, and we fixed it, and between Greg and Susan and Leah and me, we got it together, and somehow I got to this pulpit, amen. Now, I'm going to preach tonight about the speaking of the blood. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That was the announcement by John the Baptist when Jesus went to be baptized. Behold the Lamb of God. What's his name? His name is Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. He will take away the sins of the world. And from that baptistry, being baptized in the Jordan River, and the voice came from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. There you see a picture of the Trinity, for we hear the voice from heaven, we see the dove of the Holy Spirit, and the Lamb of God coming up out of the water. What a beautiful picture. 
Jesus was not led immediately into his ministry, but he was led into a time of testing. The Bible says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He was there for 40 days and 40 nights, praying, fasting, and doing warfare, using the sword of the Spirit. He never one time tried to explain if you are the Son of God. He could have said, I was born of a virgin. He could have said, you can't wait to see the miracles I'm about to do. Didn't you hear the voice from heaven? He never tried to explain himself. He just declared, it is written. And so that Lamb of God moved in what he was hearing. Amen. Verses he had no doubt memorized as a young Jewish boy growing up there in uh, the Holy Land with his stepfather, Joseph and his mother Mary, he had memorized great portions of the scriptures, but those scriptures were quickened to him by the Holy Spirit. And that precious Lamb of God came up out of that water, walked, and the Bible said led. Everybody say led. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. Now, may I submit to you, he came out of the wilderness, not just filled with the Spirit, he came out in the power of the Spirit. It says he was being filled with the Spirit and led into the wilderness. Going through the trial of the wilderness, he came out in power. Can I submit to you tonight that when you go through a trial, and how many of you are going through something that you don't know how to get out of right now? Can I challenge you tonight? Speak the word. Amen. I'm going to say it again. Speak the word. Yeah, go ahead and shout if you want to. For that's how Jesus defeated the enemy. And he didn't just go into the wilderness filled with the Spirit and came out filled with the Spirit. He came out filled with the power of the Spirit. Luke chapter 4 teaches us. And so he went about doing good, working signs, wonders, and miracles that actually caused everybody, including those that were against him and those who went to crucify him, that he truly was the Lamb of God. He truly was the Son of God. I love what the blind man said when they asked him, well, how did he, he give you your sight? He said, look, I don't know if he's good or evil. All I know is I was blind and now I see. He was kind of got a little, he kind of got a little smart at it, didn't he? He kind, of, he, he kind of rose up a little bit on him and said, hey, if you can't figure this out, I don't know how you call yourself a theologian. I don't know how you figure, if you can't figure this out, I was blind and now I see. But as he got closer to the cross, he got further from the crowds. And he would talk to his disciples about his imminent death, even on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember, he went up there to pray, and that was his pattern. He would minister and then retreat. Minister and then go retreat to the place of prayer. And when he got up into the mountain to pray on the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember Moses and Elijah appeared. That tells us that the dead are not dead. Those that we think are gone, there's still a great cloud of witnesses around us. Hallelujah. And I feel the intercessions of Jesus tonight. But I also know that if they're still following Jesus, and they are, they're still praying. Amen. And so I stand before you tonight enjoying the presence of the Lord, but also enjoying the intercessions of Jesus. And knowing what he promised me when he gave me this ministry because he gave it to me. He said, when you begin to preach this message on the blood and how it transformed your life, I will begin to pray over every person that's under the sound of your voice. Somebody lift your hands and say, pray for me now, Jesus. Because trust me, he liveth ever to make intercession for you. And Jesus there in heaven at the right hand of the Father 
I was with my pastor in that early morning prayer one morning, and I was crying out, Lord, teach me to pray. And I had what I will call an open vision. Many times we see things in our mind, but this wasn't like this. This was like a panoramic screen. In front of me, I saw the Lord carrying a huge basin filled with, filled with what I considered to be something valuable. He came to the doorpost and the altar area, if you will, with an immutable light behind him. And he throws the blood on the altar and the blood began to speak. And you know what it was speaking? It was speaking the compound names of God. And I began to hear Jehovah Sitkenu. I began to hear it in Hebrew. The Lord, our righteousness. Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord, our sanctifier. I begin to hear Jehovah Shammah, the Lord who is with us, never leaving or forsaking. Now, I don't know what you would have been doing if you had an experience like that, but let me tell you what I was doing. I was having a real revival in my spirit, overwhelmed by what I was seeing, but also being overwhelmed by what I was hearing. I was hearing what the blood was speaking over me. I was hearing what the blood is speaking over you. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your healer. Jehovah Yiri, as they say in Hebrew, we say Jara, the Lord who sees what things we have need of before we even ask him, but he still said, give us this day our daily bread. May I submit to you tonight that he is Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, your banner, tonight and that banner over you is love and that banner of love will never fail and cause you to triumph in all circumstances jehovah rohi the lord your shepherd you shall not want and there are many hundreds of names from the old covenant that represent the co those compound names are identified in the personage of the lord jesus but that's what i heard in that moment in that moment, I began to hear the blood speaking out loud. And from that day to this day, I've gone on assignments all over the world. I will never forget the night I was preaching at Billy Joe Darty's church, and I'd never met old Roberts, but Brother Copeland had had me preach through this book that I wrote called Could You Not Tarry One Hour? Seven hours in one day at a believer's convention. He took that, that seven, I believe it was probably cassette tapes to Brother Roberts, and Brother Roberts listened to all seven tapes seven times. I was down on my knees praying in the back room because it was a snowy night in Tulsa. I didn't think anybody would show up at the Maybe Center that night, but that night over 3,000 people got in that place, and it was amazing because Brother Roberts, he stood over me. I, I felt somebody walk up on me, and I didn't want to look up because I thought it might be an angel, but I felt somebody walking up on me, and I looked up, and there was old Roberts reaching his hand out to me, and his hand looked like it was about 10 inches long, his fingers, and he said, I'm old Roberts, and I put my hand up and said, I know. <laughs> that night, after I preached, I asked him to come and pray, but he thought I'd say, come up and prophesy, and he put his hand on me and said, this is an apostle of prayer. And he will put the prayer message that's in him all over the world. Shortly thereafter, I had the great honor for the first time to meet Dr. Cirillo. And when I preached, I didn't know if he knew what Oral had done. But he got up after I preached and said, this man is an apostle of prayer. And when he prays, get ready because something's going to change. Amen. I'm on assignment tonight to tell you that the blood is speaking for you. And all over the world, Dr. Cirillo and I were, I was honored to get on the airplane and go with him all over the world. Back and forth, we went to Israel. Back and forth on many occasions to Israel. And over and over and over, we did the mission to America. You'll remember that. And I was honored to go to all, most all of those because at that time I was living here in San Diego. 
the most amazing experiences that I ever saw in my life. And I would get up and Dr. Cirillo would say, this young man is an apostle of prayer. Listen, something's going to happen tonight. I'm believing tonight that God is going to break through on this meeting. We're not many here, but we are mighty here tonight. Amen. And God is going to break through on you because I'm going to begin to declare the speaking of the blood over your life in the name of Jesus. How many of you believe that the name of Jesus is the name above every name? And so I declare to you that blood is declaring over you victory over death because death was pronounced in the 10th plague of Moses over all of Egypt, over the firstborn of man and beast. But when he said, you take the life of the little lamb and you put the blood on the doorpost, as we so beautifully see here, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Later in the New Testament, it's written that he has destroyed death and brought to life life and immortality. May I submit to you tonight that when you, in your physical body, if we endure until the Lord comes, we'll go meet him in the air. But if we pass out of this body, we don't die and wake up in heaven. No. We just pass out of more mortal life into the very presence of God. It's just a passing. Death is not deadly. Death is a door for you. Why? Because the blood of Jesus is over your life. And for any of you that have a fear of death, let me stand over you tonight and declare over your life in the name of Jesus, the speaking of the blood is now declaring that there's an abolition, amen, of death. And there is immortality for you out of your body is the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody that will take that, lift a hand right now, and let's just declare in the name of Jesus. Say it out loud. In the name of Jesus, the blood declares that death will pass over me, and I will never die, for I have eternal life. Hallelujah. Can you give the Lord a praise in this house tonight? The blood is declaring eternal life for you. For the life is in the blood, and he gave his blood so that you could have eternal life. Not only is that a promise for you, but also all your sins and transgressions are forgiven for he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities and when the blood hit the earth the earth had a nervous breakdown because it shook up this mortal ball that we live on called the earth because sin had been erased and forgiven forever for all who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ your sins your sorrows that came because of your sins and the shame that came to attack you and to destroy you has no legal right over you anymore. I speak tonight in the name of Jesus. You have no right to remember what God has forgiven and what God has forgotten. Can somebody say, I take that tonight? Say it out loud. I have no right to remember what God has forgiven and what God has forgotten. Now can you declare with me in the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus has removed my sins and my shame and my guilt as far as the east is from the west and has forgotten about it. And I have no right to remember what he's already forgiven and forgotten. Give the Lord a clap offering tonight. I'm here on assignment tonight 
to tell you that the blood is speaking over your life. He's not only speaking over your life that you have eternal life, that, that sins and transgressions are forever forgiven, but also that you have peace with God. How many of you know that God Almighty, our Father, is in heaven and that he is holy? God looks at the earth now in great turmoil, but he is not having a nervous breakdown. He's not nervous about what's going on. So I'm not going to be nervous in the service. I'm going to keep on preaching this word. Why? Because I know that right under this soily earth, hallelujah, where no water seems, where no crops can grow right now, somebody's going to drill a well, hallelujah. They're going to drill a well in the name of Jesus because of the speaking of the blood. Amen. You see, because Romans 5, 1 says we have peace with God through the blood of Jesus. But Philippians 4, 6 says don't worry about anything, but pray about everything with all prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, and the peace of God. There's peace with God through the blood, but there's also the peace of God that passes all understanding. I laid down on the floor this afternoon. And while I was laying there, I'm telling you a peace that surpassed every kind of trial or trouble or tribulation in the earth. I heard about all the tornadoes that are going through the middle of the country right now. I don't know if you know about that. I don't know how many were there, Leah, but they said over 60 tornadoes have gone from Texas all the way up through Iowa, all the way through the middle of the country. The world is going nuts out there in the streets in our major universities because they don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They don't know about the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. But I'm telling you, in the midst of the nightmares of this life, I can tell you that there's a sweet dream and that sweet dream is Jesus himself ruling in your heart. For when I see the blood every morning when I get up, I focus on the blood and I declare, come kingdom of God. I see Jesus sit down on the throne of my life and righteousness, peace, and joy are mine. Not because everything's all right with me. It's because everything's all right with him. Amen. And everything begins to change because of the declaration that I have peace with God and I have the peace of God as well. We know that in this life we have mortal bodies, but we have eternal spirits and eternal souls. And from time to time we're challenged in our bodies. How many of you are going through a physical challenge right now? I'll not go into great detail here, but I will tell you that I went through cancer diagnosis, but I have no cancer in my body right now. They used back 20 years ago too much radiation on me and scar tissue built up all inside of me. So every two years, they would have to go in my body. Every two years for 18 years, they went into my body and removed the scar tissue. How many believe that was a challenge? But I would continue to declare by his stripes. Come on, somebody. I am healed. One lady urologist left me under anesthesia too long, and as a result, my kidneys completely failed. My head swelled up the size of a basketball, and my family was coming in. They thought I would surely die. It's interesting that my doctor, the head uh, of that kind of medicine, the head of all kinds of kidney problems, he was a Muslim. Let me tell you how Muslim he was. His name was Ali Ali. <laughs> Not just Ali, it was double Ali. So I began to reason with him from the scriptures laying there dying, or so they said, 
And for nine days I reasoned with him about the God of Abraham, amen, who established the three major religions of the world. But I told him about my God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who was not just a prophet, but he was the son of the living God who raised who was raised from the dead with healing in his wings. And I would talk to him about that, and he would listen kindly, respectfully. They said I could go home after they'd put a port in my chest, and they ran it down into my kidneys, and I'd gone through five rounds of dialysis while I was there in the hospital. They said, you're going to have to do this. You might live three or four more years like this. They took my blood on a Friday afternoon before they let me go home. And on Monday morning, did you call them or did they call you? They called you. And they said, the lady said on the other end of the phone, she was the head nurse at the Dr. Ali Ali office. <laughs> she said, it's wonderful. Leah said, what's wonderful? It's wonderful. His kidneys have come back to life. <laughs> Dr. Ali, Ali said, get him down to the hospital quick. We got to get that port out of his chest. It's been gone now for almost a decade. My kidneys are functioning perfectly tonight. Can I tell you why? Because by his stripes... Come on now, somebody. By his stripes. Yeah, you've gone through some things, too. Don't sit there and look at me like you've never been through anything. I had to sit still for almost six months, and all I did was sit there and pray in the Spirit and declare the Word of God. And coming out of that fire, I came out with power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that power continues to change lives today. But it's not my power. Hallelujah. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Do I have any believers in this house tonight? Somebody shout in the name of Jesus. By the speaking of the blood. I have health, and I have healing, and I receive that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Oh, I could go on, but I haven't really told you what I came to tell you yet. I'm just warming up here a little bit. You see, there's not only the forgiveness of sins, the healing of sorrows, the forgiveness, and the breaking of shame, and the healing of our bodies. But there's something else the blood does that you rarely hear anybody talk about. The blood is not only for those things, but also one more thing I will mention tonight. The blood is for transportation. The blood takes you out of the realm of the flesh into the Holy of Holies. A lot of people think if they can pray one hour, because I wrote a book called Could You Not Tarry One Hour, if they could just get through that hour, they would be all spiritual. That's not what I was teaching in that book. No, I was teaching what it says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, we come into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. How do we get in? By the blood of Jesus. My, I quoted that perfectly. Hey, how about flipping over to Hebrews chapter, let's see, 12. Yeah, there I go. And verse 24, and to Jesus... The meek, uh, 12 and 24, I know you're there. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, I knew you would get there. And the blood of sprinkling, now watch this, that speaketh 
better things than that of Abel. Cain had killed Abel, and from that first murder, every man's blood that's hit the earth has spoken of something. Abel's blood spoke of vengeance, but the blood of Jesus speaks of glory and honor and righteousness, peace, joy, and victory tonight. You see, we enter the Holy of Holies not by how long we laid on the floor, not by how much carpet we can eat, but may I submit to you that the force that moves us out of the realm of the flesh into the realm of the Spirit is the blood that is speaking over your life right now, and it is speaking this word, come on in. It's saying entrance, welcome into this place. You can come before the Holy of Holies, not in your righteousness, not in your strength, not by works of our righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, that at that mercy seat there is blood still speaking for you tonight. And we can say by the speaking of the blood, Hallelujah. I'm coming before you now, my heavenly Father. Do you not see it? We were, we were purchased not with silver and gold or corruptible things, but we were purchased by the precious blood of the Lamb. And that blood is speaking over you, sir. That blood is speaking over you, dear Greg. That blood is speaking over you, dear Susan. God loves us so much that he let the blood of his own, own son be the qualifying agent to give us a right to come before his holiness. I came here tonight to not only challenge you, not only call you, but to help you begin to pray on the authority of the name that is above every name and to pray according to the speaking of the blood because the de declaration I give tonight is that in your experience, the blood is speaking for you right now. Whatever you're going through tonight, in Jesus' name, declare the speaking of the blood over that thing. You that have gone through tremendous trials financially, Hallelujah, begin to declare. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, what? I am rich because of what the Lord has done for me. And so I call you tonight to join with me, and let's begin to declare it over our own lives. Everybody who's going through some kind of trial in your personal life, I want you to stand up on your feet right where you are. I'm not calling you into the altar. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right where you are. You're going through a trial, maybe in your ministry. There are so many people called to the ministry, they don't know how to get to it. Here's how we get to it. Lift up both your hands, if you will, right where you are. And begin to say out loud, by the speaking of the blood. In the name of Jesus, I declare, come, kingdom of God. I declare, be done, will of God. In and through my life, in my spirit, man, in my mind, in my emotions, Lord, in my finances. Lord, I believe you're still an excellent bread maker. So give me today my daily bread according to the speaking of the blood. Lift your hands if you would, please. Because I saw it in my spirit that just beneath the surface there is literally a tsunami of Holy Spirit oil that's about to burst out and cause the single greatest revival 
here at the end of time the greatest single revival in the history of the world but it's not going to happen because of great preaching it's going to happen because of great faith in the power of the blood that speaks over us tonight can you lift up both your hands and begin to pray in the holy spirit because he's going to cause a gusher a literal gusher a literal tsunami of the holy spirit if you pray in tongues go ahead and release your prayer language right now I was created to do this with you. Because the blood is speaking at the altar, I have the right to your righteousness. Hallelujah. To your sanctification, to your peace, to your power, to your presence. Heavenly Father, I believe over every person in this room a revelation that's what's going on right now, oh my. Everybody has wondered what Jesus is really praying over us. May I submit to you, he is at the right hand of the Father. How many of you know Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father? From time to time, he stands up. When he sees one like Stephen about to experience a death where he says, into your hands I commit my spirit, lay not this sin to their charge. May I submit to you tonight, I know what Jesus is praying over you. He's praying what the blood is speaking over you. For the blood is speaking over whatever your need is, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, or financially. He's praying over that right now. Let's get in agreement with Him right now. For it is the Spirit and the water of the Word and the blood of Jesus, John the Apostle said. They're in agreement. We are in agreement with you tonight, dear Lord. Now, Father, I believe for miracles, supernatural miracles right where they stand, supernatural breakthroughs right where they are. Oh, I see it. I don't know how many. I don't know how many. I don't know how many. But I know there are a number of you that are like those four families in Kilgore, Texas. There were four families that owned the four plots of land that became the wealthiest acre in America for 50 years. I don't know if it's four people. I don't know who you are. But how many of you have a promise from God about your finances that has not yet come to pass? Can I tell you it's on the way? Because I know my Lord, He is no respecter of persons. He's no respecter of persons. He's praying for you right now according to the blood that is declaring He is Jehovah Jireh. Do you know what Jireh means? It's the word Yiri in Hebrew. It means I see what you have need of before you ask. It comes from the time when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, but you do remember there was a ram caught in the thicket. They couldn't see the ram coming at the same time when Abraham was taking Isaac up the other side of the mountain, but it was on the way. Somebody, it's on, somebody say, it's on the way for me. It's on the way for you. But this is what I do know. 
just like in the little town that I grew up in. God has ordained somebody in this room, and it may be more than one. I carried in here four people. And it may be more than that, but at least four. Yeah, you folks that are online as well, I want you to grab hold of this promise. Because you are there right now, and He is in heaven praying it for you get in agreement with him you are my provider say it out loud you are my provider hallelujah you're the one who sees what i need before i ask so, so i'm asking i'm seeking i'm knocking and the door is coming open now oh glory to god those four families in my hometown they went from being dirt farmers to multi-gozillionaires. I got that word, I think, from Forrest Gump. I don't know where I got gozillionaires. I don't know where it came from, but they had so much money they couldn't count at all. And the reason Kilgore, Texas, never grew more than 10,000, because those four families said, we're going to keep our nice little town a nice little town. And they built one junior college, beautiful high schools, beautiful roads, beautiful everything, and they sent all the money up to Dallas. And Dallas became Dallas. Can I tell you that kind of resource is being released in this room right now? Somebody lift your hand. I feel it going all over me right now. I feel the anointing of God moving all through me right now. Lord, right now, loose the supernatural resources and the transfer of wealth to be loosed in this room. The water well that they dug, Brother Greg, that brought the gusher of oil, the tsunami of oil that literally covered that area for 50 full years, a lake of oil came out of the earth. It cost about Somebody said, well, it might have cost $500. Somebody said it might have cost $100. They don't know what the well cost, but it wasn't more than five. Might have been a thousand. I don't know. But what they got out of it, somebody had a good idea. Let's drill a water well. How many of you know that if they hadn't dug the water well, if they'd done nothing, they'd have got nothing. But because they did something, brother, something happened. Amen. One day, old Roberts pulled me aside and said, Larry, did you know a farmer can stand over his field and pray over it till he dies, till he turns blue in the face and goes to heaven? But until he puts a seed in the ground, then he can pray over it, and it will come to life. It will germinate in due season, and it will come to life. And out of that one seed can come a great oak tree. I submit to you tonight that I'm supposed to pray over you that God would speak to you that in this auditorium tonight and you that are online as well are being called to sow something to the Lord. All of you that will wave a hand and say, I believe for a miracle in my resources and I need it, wave at me right now. Sow something to the Lord tonight. Brother Greg will come in a moment and share some things with you, and I'm going to ask him to explain it. But may I submit to you that I want to pray over you first. Would you say out loud, in the name of Jesus, I want to sow the right seed for the supernatural release and the meeting of all my needs, not according to my needs, but according to your riches. Now, if you believe God is rich, just wave your hands to him. According to his riches, the apostle said, that fruit may abound to your account, he said, not for me, he said, for your sake. God shall supply all your needs according to his riches 
Now say these words out loud. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you sowed by sowing your life as a seed so that a multitude of a harvest all over the world could be saved. Lord Jesus, what would you have me sow tonight? I will listen and I will obey you tonight. And I listen to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, speak to them because there is a specific seed for specific needs and there are breakthrough miracles in this room tonight and I'm believing God that you'll do it listen to the Lord Dr. Cho told me when I was there preaching the secret is to pray listen and obey come brother Gray if you would please how many of you will obey God tonight in your giving if you will wave at me right now because it's a signal to God. Go ahead and wave at me. Amen.